Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone near and far. Uh, some of you have come just really locally here. I could probably walk to your homes. And others of you are halfway around the world. Um, and I just want to say thank you for joining in um, to learn about um, how incredible seaweeds can be for us, uh, for mind, body, health, and healing. Uh, so we'll begin the first of the, the segments, um, seaweeds following the tides to health and nutrition. Um, many of you um, I have met before, uh, but some of you, um, this is kind of the first time. So um, welcome old friends and welcome new friends too. Uh, my name is Karen Sherwood. I teach ethnobotany here in the Pacific Northwest, Washington State. Um, this is where I was born and raised, grew up in this area. And a little bit of my background, um, I, uh, um, gosh, growing up in the Northwest, um, the um, daughter of teachers, um, we had summers kind of open, um, but, you know, as, as many of you who are teachers know that, um, you know, that's not, uh, uh, you know, a high paying job and certainly not way back uh, 50 years ago. And um, so my dad had this uh, opportunity to go um, and fish with a friend of his um, off the waters in Washington State. And we spent our summers up uh, in the San Juan Islands. Um, as kids, we were um, kind of kicked out of the house when we were very, well, it was a cabin. Um, there was 10 of us in a 40 by 40 foot cabin. So um, as you can imagine, when our dads needed to rest, um, he, that, us as kids were kicked out and said, you know, go play at the beaches. And it was there that that deep connection um, to um, the ocean, the tides, the Salish Sea, um, and the rhythms of the earth really became just second nature. Um, we were able to learn all about the fish, the shellfish, and the seaweeds that were there. And it wasn't until later in my life that these became really that integral portion of what I'm about. Um, and that ability to take me on this journey to health and healing. Um, this is a very personal one for me. Um, and I'll share a little bit about that. But before we get there, um, you know, I went to school um, here in the Northwest. Um, I studied biology, botany at Western, and then on to the University of Washington. Um, from there, many of you I connected um, with at the Tracker School. So teaching wilderness survival um, and developing um, and expanding and teaching the wild foods um, and wild edible medicinal utilitarian plant segment um, really gave me that hands-on everyday experience incorporating wild foods into my diet. Um, but it wasn't until returning back to the Northwest from the East Coast that seaweeds became that really important part of my health and healing. Um, it was after kind of returning here and in my mid forties began to develop some health issues. And for me, I had a knee injury um, that didn't let, allow me to get around very much and I didn't take care of it. Um, I began to gain weight um, and then um, not being able to get around, you know, that uh, continued to high blood pressure. Um, and um, it wasn't until years later that I actually um, found out that I had thyroid issues along with that. And so these things compiled one on top of the other just really led to this downhill slide. Um, in my health. And you know, you try to just push through it, struggle through it, but then there comes that point um, where it just seems overwhelming. 
Um, and it was at that point that I began to address um, my thyroid issues by adding seaweeds to my diet. Um, they can be so good for nourishing our thyroid um, and helping it to really do its job. And so seaweeds um, helped with that. But it came to a point that it wasn't working for me anymore. Um, and I just felt low energy, sluggish. And for me, I had these incredible heart palpitations that my heart just seemed to be want to burst through my chest. And it was at that point I said, okay, I need to get some help. And I had an amazing doctor who stepped into my life and caring, compassionate, and said, let's get this, let's get your health back on track. Um, and I was really disappointed when she said, okay, well, you need to go on thyroid medicine um, and supplement. I was like, oh gosh, I, you know, I feel, felt like I'd failed. But then I found out that both my mom and my sister had needed that extra um, thyroid support 10 years prior to me. And I thought, oh, well, this is, you know, this is, um, you know, a small um, but good thing in my life. Um, and so, you know, that helped a little bit, but I'd still had high blood pressure issues to deal with, um, my knee injury, and I was severely overweight. Um, seaweeds helped with each and every part of this, and they were that integral part of my recovery. So now I stand, um, and for many of you, you, you know, you know me um, from back, way back when, um, and over the class course of the last four years or so, I was able to lose 100 pounds. My blood pressure is great. Let's check up 102 over 68. So awesome. Um, and also this miraculous change of my knee and helping to nourish, rebuild, um, rebuild cartilage. Um, and that through um, wonderful support from great physical therapy. Um, I have my life back on track now. I feel like it's really going in that great direction. And um, two years ago, I was able to run my first 5K. Seaweeds were that constant in my life that really helped me to move forward and address all these issues. They can create miracles in our own lives, support us in so many ways. So today, that's what we're gonna really um, give that glimpse into is what they can do for us, um, how they can really benefit us. You know, Hippocrates has said um, many hundreds, uh, hundreds of years ago, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. You know, seaweeds really epitomizes this. Um, they can come into our lives in small amounts or large amounts, but as our food, they continue to nourish us in so many ways. Um, anyway, miracles can be created. And that's why I'm here today, is to share a piece of that and to hopefully um, encourage you also to bring this incredible food, medicine um, into, into our lives um, in whatever way that you see fit. You know, um, seaweeds um, provide so much for us. We, we talk about them um, as marine algaes and seaweeds are synonymous with one another. They provide for us every single mineral that our bodies in, are in need of, every single mineral and in the right balance there. Um, so who needs a mineral supplement when we can get that through our food? very high in protein. Some of them have up to 40% um, protein in them, an amazing food resource for us. Um, they um, are easy to harvest. 
sustainable, safe when we talk about um, good places to harvest, um, and much safer actually than land plants because in um, our North Pacific waters here, we have the most abundant um, source of seaweeds, um, diversity of them, and every single one of them is uh, non-toxic. All those ones that are the macroalgae, we're not talking about the microscopic ones, but the macroalgae, we can let our palates be our guide for us. You know, we have this great saying that when the tide is out, soup is on. Um, and truly, that's one of the easiest ways to bring them into our diets. So when we talk about seaweeds, um, you know, it's not a new thing. Um, seaweeds are marine algaes, um, not the new kid on the block here. And for thousands upon thousands of years, they've been used as food um, and for healing um, by indigenous peoples around the world. So it's not just here in the North Pacific, but it's also around the world. Seaweeds have supported um, health and nutrition for people. If we look back in the archaeological record, um, that record shows us that 14,500 years ago, seaweeds were used. Um, and <clears throat> we can actually follow their use on what it's now termed the kelp highway. Um, and as people migrated from the northern areas across what's now Alaska and down the Pacific coast, the archaeological record shows that they traveled in those coastal areas. Um, and in part because of um, the year round food resources that were there. Now, seaweeds do have a season. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but um, I want to talk a little bit about that history of them around the world. Um, so we'll kind of go through that whole piece of things. But um, <clears throat> as we follow that kelp highway down um, the Pacific coast and then down um, through Central America, um, it goes all the way down to Monteverde um, in Chile, um, where it's shown that nine different kinds of seaweeds um, have been discovered um, in the digs down there. And many of those are still in use today um, by the people who still live in that region. They're used by um, those um, people, not only for food, but for help, helpful for um, health issues that still exist now. Um, so think about 14,000 years of use. It's got to be a good thing, right, if it's sustained over that period of time um, to nourish and heal um, the people that are there. The question becomes really, um, you know, how do we learn? And even if we're not in those coastal areas and have that opportunity to go out, we still um, can make use of seaweeds. Um, there are some resources that I'll be sharing with you um, at the end of the broadcast that will help you um, to find seaweeds, even if you're not in those coastal waters. But many of us do live there, and so we begin to learn about them. Um, I want to mention, too, just a little bit, kind of looking back into history um, in, over in China. There's a long history of use, um, documented um, uses of them 5,000 years ago. Um, Shen Yong, um, the emperor of China, um, used them, um, one, because of their, um, their salty and spicy flavor to them. And in um, Ayurvedic medicine, um, this really indicates that um, their uses um, how can they support our bodies? Um, and that really is an uh, indication that they're used to, um, to soften um, and moisten. Okay, so that they're also used to soothe, um, to shrink lumps, tumors, 
um, but also to relax and relieve tension throughout the body, not only specifically, but overall generally. Um, so with that, their uses move forward for gut or intestinal problems. Um, they were used for bronchitis, so lung issues going on. Still today, we see that. Um, endocrine system disorders um, and intestinal disorders, constipation. And um, in Chinese medicine, you know, the movement, um, you know, your digestion really plays an important role in health. And so seaweeds really help to support that in so many different ways. Um, so 5,000 years ago and up to present, still used in China. Um, over here in North America, in the 1700s, seaweeds are a really important component for um, goiter um, and um, helping with um, vitamin C um, deficiencies as well. Over in Japan, you know, around the world, seaweeds are used. Over in Japan, they still celebrate um, their high regard for seaweeds. Um, and in February 6th um, is proclaimed seaweed day. Okay. Um, in Hawaii, um, seaweed gardens um, have been um, tended for thousands of years um, to help bring that food and that seasonal food to the people that live there. Um, they were used for famine food um, by the Irish, where the monks would go out and collect and um, give seaweeds to the poor. Interestingly enough, um, it became um, that piece of their diet that really helped to improve. So many of the poor who didn't have other types of food were actually in better health because of their use of seaweeds. Um, you know, unfortunately became associated with kind of famine food and poor people's food in that area, but other places around the world seaweeds were really highly regarded, okay? Um, not only were they for food or in medicine, but marine algae is held an important piece as far as utilitarian uses. Um, they were used for um, the neurocystis or bull with kelp was used for pipe or um, um, piping um, in um, the longhouses, um, plank houses here in the Pacific Northwest. They were used for storage vessels as well, the hollow tubes of bulwark kelp. They make an incredible fertilizer and those fields that were um, fertilized with seaweeds had all that mineral replacement back in and it actually helps to sustain the soil, um, improve the root growth of plants, stimulate root production, um, and also nourish the vegetables that grow there. So an amazing resource. In a little bit, I'll show you um, some pictures that I have of how my own garden has benefited from that. So, um, the Venetians um, in early history were known as exquisite um, glass makers. And they made incredible, beautiful pieces out of glass. And not only was their glass incredibly clear um, to see through, um, but also um, it was able to be formed into these amazing shapes um, and still malleable. And it was um, the potash from burnt seaweed, the residue that was left behind that was added into kind of the glass making process that allowed for that clarity and also um, allowed it to be very malleable over a longer period of time to create these incredible shapes. Um, gosh, was used um, in Norway for um, soap making. It was used for salt um, there. It was used for, um, uh, for glass making too. Mm -hmm. And kind of back to um, the, um, the Inuit in the Northwest, that important resource of vitamin C. Um, you know, we don't need those citrus orchards of, you know, California and Florida or, or other places. 
but seaweeds actually have an incredible source of vitamin C. And when other foods weren't available, especially plants in kind of those colder boreal regions, um, seaweeds can be um, utilized in the coastal areas, but also transported um, across and used throughout the year. Um, so that's kind of just a really, really amazing thing. So we see throughout history, they have supported people. Um, but today, um, I think even more than ever, seaweeds hold that place for us in our diet. They're incredibly sustainable for us. Um, and um, seaweeds for us, support us even beyond kind of food and healing. They account for about 90% of the um, oxygen in our atmosphere. Just one reason to keep our oceans clean, right? So seaweeds can grow. 80% um, um, of our organic matter is actually created by seaweeds as well. Um, seaweeds are really, um, so valuable and one of those resources that we think, uh, we don't think a lot of times about um, unless we live in those coastal regions. So how do we learn? How do we learn about our seaweeds? There are some great books out there and I'm gonna take just a moment to share some of those with you. I have them over here to the side, so I'll kind of bring them in. One at a time. Um, We'll show, let's see if we can see that one. Pacific Seaweeds um, is one of our um, favorite books here in the Pacific Northwest. It's one of those that has been redone. And um, so the newest version is really the best of it. Lots of improvements. Um, and it helps us to really take a look and um, identify the seaweeds that are there. Okay and also give some um, really fun recipes. One of these ones, I made this seaweed kimchi one time um, that's in this, in this book, let's see. How about right about there? Um, anyway, a great book to help us identify um, and um, even to use seaweeds. Small little book that costs about 10 bucks um, and this is one, the common edible seaweeds in the Gulf of Alaska. And while it's really simple, it um, covers those foundation marine algaes that are so useful for us. Talks about what parts to gather, how to use them, and it's just a really sweet little book. Kind of a an very old one, and my copy is really used. I know you can't really see it that well, um, but this is Sea Vegetables Harvesting Guide and Cookbook. Um, Evelyn McConaughey is the author of this one, and it's um, published a long time ago, but still is really um, one of those great books for helping to identify, use, um, and understand seaweeds. Um, I will make mention that probably the recipes are a little bit outdated. Um, we don't so much anymore use canned uh, cream of mushroom soup um, and that type of thing, but um, the information is really, really good. Um, so uh, another great one. Um, this was a book that was given to me um, by a friend, Fred Peck, thank you very much. Um, and the Sea Vegetable Book, Foraging and Cooking Seaweeds. Great information in here, great identification, um, great understanding. It's a little bit more challenging to find. Um, it was used by a as a textbook um, in some schools and um, is, but is really has good information. So and that's another one. And 
Just a couple more. So my books are mostly focused on, on Pacific seaweeds. Seaweeds are found around the world, but you know, our oceans connect around the world too. So we'll find some that are in the North Pacific here, um, some South Pacific, some over in the Atlantic. Um, some of those um, go around the world and other ones are unique to different areas. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, but another one, North Pacific seaweeds um, is one. This one's also a little bit um, challenging to find. Um, it's um, published by Plant Press in Ock Bay, Alaska. But um, I love this book. Uh, it's helped me to identify seaweeds that were otherwise a mystery to me. Um, and um, also has a few great recipes in there, um, but um, great ID guide. And kind of a, a, from a scientific approach, a um, little bit heady information, but um, seaweeds edible, available, um, and sustainable um, is a great one if you want to kind of get into some scientific pieces of seaweeds. Um, Ole Mortensen is the author for this one. Um, but probably my favorite of, oops, <laughs> of all times, you know, bringing food to people has been kind of my life's work. Um, and it brings me so much joy. And seaweeds are a huge part of that. Um, but someone who has been just inspiring, um, Prenny Radigan writes the, um, the Irish Seaweeds Kitchen. Oh my gosh, so great. So it talks about identifying, using um, the values of seaweeds, the seasonality of it. Um, so if you were to get one book, maybe take a look at that one there. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures from here. Oh, let's just choose a really fun one. I have one marked back here. Oh, that one looks good. Okay, let's just do this one. Okay. Land and sea spaghetti, prawns with land and sea spaghetti. I mean, who doesn't want to eat right now, right? Um, but um, there are breads made with them. There are traditional recipes. There are smoothies. There are seasonings. There are um, soups, of course, some of our basic uses for that, but even desserts. Seaweed brownies, if you haven't had them, really, you need to, okay? And so you can make them with that, that are grain-free if you want to. Um, but so much fun. Look at this one. Okay. Let's just see that. Hopefully you can see that. Sticky figgy pudding with brandied alaria. Oh, come on now. Who doesn't want that? I do. Okay. Well, anyway, so probably sales of that book will skyrocket. Um, love it. Anyway, and then finally, many of you know that I absolutely love this book, Discovering Wild Plants by Janice Schofield. And while the focus really is on terrestrial plants, there are many land or many um, seaweeds that are also highlighted in here with some great recipes for them. So um, it's while it's um, for Alaska and Canada, it actually can go down. Um, the entire West Coast to um, about two thirds of the way down California. Those same seaweeds are found there. Um, so we have um, many, many different ways that we can use seaweeds. Um, I have a little slide presentation that hopefully will begin to inspire you to use them. Um, so I'm gonna start that now. I apologize in advance if there's any little technical issues, we'll try to get through them here. So I put together um, 
this slide presentation, and it's really um, is um, a, a, that personal journey that I mentioned before. Um, seaweeds have allowed me to return to health. Um, and the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we bring them in? Um, and one of the first things is um, to um, really to understand how good they can be for us. So here's hopefully some inspiration there. Um, you know, those um, seaweeds are found all the way around the world um, in the coastal areas. Um, they have such a long, long history of, of use to them. Um, and so when we're in those areas, um, what we find is that um, we can go to explore them. Um, we're still learning so much more about their uses. Uh, every day, new information is being revealed. All the time, um, new studies are being released, which really highlight how incredible seaweeds can be for our health and our healing. Um, as new issues rise, um, with our current global situations, seaweeds really are there to help support us, to keep us strong. Um, and in those coastal regions, um, amazing things can happen. Okay. Seaweeds come to us, um, one of the ways is through our food and so many different ways that they come to us. Um, but let's see. Back here. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Down at the um, lower left of the screen, um, we have some seaweed seasoned butter. Now, I'm a big butter fan. Maybe I shouldn't eat as much of it, but you know, by adding some um, seaweed to it, um, it instead of salt um, or in addition to garlic, you know, all um, it becomes this really nourishing spread that we can put on. And we can put it on bread, we can, um, if we want, or it can go to see, uh, oh my gosh, found this new chickweed pasta, or chick, chickpea pasta, chickweed pasta would be good too, right? But um, chickpea pasta, seaweed seasoning, a little bit of seaweed butter on there, some garlic, oh my gosh, it's to live for. Um, but Seaweeds can come to us in our salads as well. Uh, seaweed salad, we can mix our favorite terrestrial um, salad greens along with um, sea vegetables. And it's a wonderful combination, giving us both those gifts of land and of sea. Main courses you see here, this is a dish that um, we love preparing and um, I'll serve it for the seaweeds and coastal foraging class that we host every year um, up in the San Juan Islands. And this is a Sicilian, um, in this case, instead of shark steaks, which was the original recipe, I've substituted halibut steaks or sometimes um, sea bass in there as well. But um, a kind of white fish. And there is a kind of a homemade pasta sauce that we put on this and my favorite seaweeds this one had alaria in it or winged kelp um, so um, that goes into that cooks mingles those flavors um, adds nourishment um, as well as helps to promote digestion okay. and then up there in the very back I don't know if you can see it or not let's see if I can use the pointer without changing the slide. Oh, there we go. Yes. Uh, there are those seaweed brownies and the seaweeds added to them. It's not enough to make them taste like the ocean, maybe just a hint, but it adds um, a mineral salt to them, but also makes them just smooth and um, gosh, I don't even know how to describe it. So very good. So seaweed seasoned brownies, it's to live for. Um, so, so many ways they can come in. It doesn't have to be just, you know, munching on seaweeds. Um, you know, typically we think about um, nori, 
that's what comes to mind for many of us, our, our exposure to seaweeds um, and those little uh, seaweed wrapped rice bundles that, um, you know, can have vegetables in the inside, can have um, seafood on them, whatever we want. We can make our own really easily. It is one of the seaweeds that grow around here abundantly and actually around the world um, and is so valuable that it's um, farmed around the world. One of the easiest things though, and we're gonna do this at the very end of the program, I'm gonna show you how to make our three sisters seaweed seasoning. And it's something that we can just keep on our counter. We can leave it there and put it on our scrambled eggs in the morning or in our oatmeal in the morning um, or um, a sprinkling um, of seaweed on our, you know, if we do pasta or rice. Um, it can go into cooked soups as a nice addition, but it's really easy and we can add whatever seaweeds we want into it. So basically they're all ground up together um, and put together in whatever combination you like. Um, I have my favorites, but they're great. And those go into, here's another example of that butter. We cook a bunch of yams and onions in a steam pit. Um, and had um, some seaweed seasoned butter for um, an accompaniment to them. So a little bit of land and sea gift. Um, another way to use that seaweed seasoning um, is through pre-made dishes, or we can make our own, in this case, hummus, and it's put together, sprinkled in that seaweed seasoning, gives us this really wonderful, rich um, flavor to it. Um, it's that fifth taste sense, that umami flavor um, that we get through the, sea, the um, seaweeds. And it can add so much um, goodness, vitality, um, just that um, rich um, kind of nutrient dense flavor to it flavorful. Okay. As a main course, um, this is a stir fry that we have done with fucus bladder rack, otherwise named stir fry weed. So appropriately, we put it in a stir fry. Um, and it is these bright green pieces. We well, have some peas in there too. But these, um, these green pieces here is all that bladder rack. Um, and that really helps to promote digestion, um, soothe inflammation, uh, actually internally and externally. So we can use it topically, but internally, um, it's just a really wonderful stir fry vegetable. And we'll talk a little later about that. Okay. And of course our salads. Um, toasted, pickled, or as we prefer, marinated in a little bit of rice vinegar and some tamari really tenderizes a seaweed cut into strips. Um, and it makes it a little bit less chewy and also kind of pre-dresses our terrestrial greens. Um, so we had a little bit of color there with some rose petals and we're good to go. So this was um, some wild greens, <clears throat> some um, homegrown domestic greens, and some seaweeds that we had harvested fresh and then marinated um, in some rice vinegar. A little sesame oil too. Um, another salad um, and just crumbled seaweed in there with cucumbers, onions, um, some rose hips in this case, um, and a light dressing. So muffin, cornbread are another way, you know, we wouldn't expect to use seaweeds and cornbread, but instead of adding a kind of a seaweed or ocean flavor, um, it just makes these um, just really moist um, and adds that extra vital piece of nutrition in. Remember every single mineral that our bodies need, seaweeds can offer to us. 
Okay. Now it comes to our breakfast in the morning. Those of you who have joined some of our classes here know about our baked oatmeal. Um, this is one that we like to serve um, at the Seeds and Coastal Foraging class. Fresh blueberries in there, baked in, and lots of seaweed in there. So this one actually had a lot of seaweed, and so it did taste like a hint of seaweed in there, but it wasn't overwhelming. Um, so it also makes our oatmeal more creamy. Um, so if we let it sit overnight, and for instance, overnight oatmeal, seaweeds come to the next morning and um, we don't have to cook it even if we don't want to. I usually do because I like mine warm, but it just makes a really nice creamy consistency. So good. And another thing that we can do is to pickle our seaweeds. So they can come into every course, but also come as a condiment as well. We have so much opportunity um, and we can fit those marine algaes in everywhere. So this is uh, some um, kelp relish that we've um, put together with some um, peppers and onions and um, some seasoning in there. Um, and we char it up and it's one of my absolute favorites. Kind of goes on everything, honestly. So whether you're a burger fan, either meat or non-meat, it goes really well with this um, as a condiment in um, kind of mixing in with other um, salads that you might make. Um, this is a great thing to do or just on a sandwich. It's lovely. Okay. So it comes to us, um, that's one that we use, bull kelp or neriocystis. Picture of that. Now, regulations here in Washington state have changed. We used to be able to harvest the stipe of it or the stem-like structure, um, but now we cannot. We have to go down to Oregon to get it. <laughs> so um, we can't here in Washington harvest that point part, but we can still harvest um, and utilize the laminate or blade leaf-like structures um, of seaweed. Um, they're not actually vascular plants, um, so they're not true leaves. They do still photosynthesize, um, but they get all their nutrients to absorb through um, the cell walls from the surrounding water that bathes them. Um, so those are not true leaves, but um, laminae or blades, we call them. We love them and they're um, nutrient mineral rich and dried out a nice tasty salt, salty snack, but we can also use them for salt substitute. Okay. Um, and so um, if we can go to those areas where we can harvest them, the stipes can be pickled also. And many of you have had the bullock, um, pickled bullock kelp that we do. Um, it's lovely. Here's some, um, uh, a different one. These are the little bulbs here to the side. If you look on the picture here, a um, little bit of garlic in there. Um, this is a grisha or feathered boa. And then here's the hollow stipes um, of the bulk kelp. Got pickles. Yum. Delicious. One of our favorite things to do is to stuff them with cheese. Okay, so who doesn't like cheese? Okay, maybe we shouldn't have that much of it, but a little bit, um, and this is mozzarella cheese. So it's just those little cheese sticks stuffed into those hollow tubes and then sliced up. How fun is that, right? And it's this great pairing of kind of this salty pickle um, with this cheese together, both adding that a bit of that umami flavor to it. And so it's that rich, um, flavor that we have. Love it. And as always, you have to make it beautiful, right? So arrange it nice. It always tastes better. And here is that main dish. So don't forget seaweeds as a main dish and accompaniment to that. So halibut steaks that are here, 
um, and that um, kind of that tomato basil sauce, you see fresh basil on top, but mixed in we cook in with that um, sauce um, is your favorite marine algae, Alaria, Neriocystis, um, we've done Porphyra, Ulva, um, all of those really make great additions along with um, any of our laminaria species or even sugar wrap saccharina. So each one gives a little bit different flavor profile, but all of them super delicious. So uh, just a minute here. Um, I'm going to, um, at this point, let's see, I want to, um, I think at this point, why don't we take about a 10 minute break before getting into um, kind of the different classifications of seaweeds. I wanna go over that with you um, to kind of create this understanding of, you know, how they're grouped, how we identify them, and even where they grow in relationship to kind of that grouping that they have. Um, so when we come back, we'll talk about a little bit um, about the classifications, the structure, and where we find them. Okay, so we'll see you back in um, 10 minutes. Thank you. What are you eating? Oh my gosh, seaweed power balls. Whoa. So good. So at the end of the show, you have to you have to go through the dreary stuff, you know, first the classifications, the structure and function before we get into the really fun stuff. So we're gonna make some three sisters seaweed seasoning up right here on camera, and then we're gonna put it into our seaweed power balls, the best snack, so good for you, um, providing electrolytes for us and a so tasty. So I could eat them all up, but, you know, it really is rude for me to eat on camera. So, you know, talk with my mouth full. Uh, just do it. Just do it. But anyway, so I have those right here that we'll take a look at and then we'll make up in a little bit because, you know, it, it all gets back to the food, right? <laughs> so um, I think we'll continue on. And let me see if I can do this. So where everybody is there. And I'm going to go back to screen share. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, there's a long history of use. Um, and we still really are learning more and more about them. But seaweeds can be present in our daily lives. So whether we live in the coastal areas or we need to purchase them from um, good, reputable sources, those are options to us. So if you live in, um, you know, gosh, in an in, in area, mountainous area, you can't get out to the coastal area for if you um, live in the central U.S., you know, you can still get really good seaweeds um, to help nourish, add to your diet. You will know that there's a huge difference in the way that you feel um, and um, just, you know, your overall health. So they help in so many ways. Um, so we talk about them that, um, you know, we move this, really this use of them into the mainstream. Um, there are really volumes of documented, um, therapeutic, therapeutic um, medicinal, um, preventative uses of seaweeds. In, um, the remaining sessions, we're gonna get into a little bit more about specific seaweeds and their, um, their really focused um, therapeutic uses and what's in them, talk a little bit about some of the great studies and um, how we can use them for um, health issues, whether it be um, blood pressure, um, joint issues and inflammation, a huge one that has helped me personally um, you know, that blood pressure thing going on and helping to normalize it, weight loss, just promoting um, good um, digestive health as well. Um, but, um, the, you know, that the list goes on and we'll talk a little bit about that. But 
um, as a reminder that um, these um, marine algaes have 10 to 20 times the mineral content that land plants do. Kind of depends on what species that we're talking about. But, and every single mineral that our bodies need are found there. I mean, for that reason alone is really a good, um, you know, it should be good enough to add seaweeds to our diet. Um, most of them have all the essential amino acids which our bodies cannot manufacture on their own. And so seaweeds can offer that to us. Remember that seaweeds are bathed in seawater. Um, that, um, and seawater is really close in composition to that of our blood. And so taking in these minerals into um, their um, the bodies of the seaweeds, um, and then for us to use them as food, we get that complement to them. Um, marine algae are higher in vitamin and mineral content than any other class of food. I mean, that's just, it's just amazing to me um, that why we don't make more use of this incredible resource. They're sustainable. They're just like one of the most sustainable food sources that we have. Um, and um, uh, seaweeds really are described as one of the most nutritious forms of vegetation on this planet. Um, I just, I can't say enough about them. Um, and so we talked about the trace minerals and in the correct balance that, that we need them to be in. Um, the groups of seaweeds, um, there's three major groups of seaweeds, which we're gonna kind of see in the slideshow now. Um, and these include uh, the chlorophyta, the theophyta, and rhodophyta. Um, and um, these groups, um, really, sometimes they speak to the color of them, but sometimes their colors are masked by, um, you know, um, um, other colorations going on. So um, here we have the chlorophyta group, um, and this is uh, Ulva intestinalis. I mean, wouldn't you just want to eat that, that a plant with that name, right? Ulva intestinalis. Um, it used to be Entromorpha intestinalis, which I really liked saying a whole lot better, but um, it's related to um, sea lettuce or Ulva, which is in the Ulva genus. Um, anyway, a member of the chlorophyta group, the green marine algae, and they typically really do show their colors as green. Um, oftentimes we find these kind of in the upper areas. Most of them are benthic, which means that they're attached to um, the, uh, um, the sea floor or the rocks around. Um, some of them are pelagic, which means that they're kind of free floating around. There's some species that are just kind of hanging out there and then move, um, but most of them are benthic, okay? So um, this is one that is so fun to add into salads, marinate it just a little bit, and you have these long strings of stuff, but also put into kind of your favorite pasta or paired with the red marine algae called sea spaghetti, come on. Is that not the greatest? Fun with food, right? Fun with sea vegetables. Okay. Um, another group, um, one of our kelps here, is a member of the Theophyta or brown marine algae. Um, this is Alaria um, that um, Bob's holding up right here. And um, it has uh, a long laminae. Um, a mid vein that goes down through us and kind of wavy leaf margins to it. Um, this one is attached um, to the benthos here, attached to the rocks underneath. And when we go out to, um, to gather it, um, we don't gather the whole thing. Um, it has a growing plate of it down near the base of it. And so if we cut it beyond there, it will continue on growing. Okay, so here we have, you know, we would cut the last one third of it, it actually goes down in here away. So if we cut it here, we have plenty for us to use and 
plenty for it to keep on growing down. Okay. Um, and this is um, a member of the, <laughs> the Rota Fida group. Um, this is um, Palmeria or, or Dulce, it's called. Dulce. Um, and Jill's holding it here. And I love this because those marine algae match her hair, right? I mean, who doesn't love that picture? Um, rich in iron. Um, this is a um, really strongly flavored one, but one that has been cherished literally for centuries um, together. Um, and so where do they live? It's not just a free for all out there. Actually, there are specific homes that marine algaes really enjoy. Some of them really need that tidal influx of the waves moving back and forth and back and forth. And others are a little bit more fragile and get a little torn up with that. And so they grow in a little bit more protected areas. So by learning about individual ones, we can predict where we might find them. You know, are they perennial? Are they annuals and go through their cycles? By understanding that, we can know the seasons that we can go at in. So um, we have um, kind of um, two different groups there where they live. Um, pelagic means that they're kind of free floating around um, sargassum. You know, there's huge seas of the sargassum sea, sargassum sea that um, if, when boats go out there, um, it looks like they're landlocked because of um, just these huge tides of um, sargassum um, that grow out there and are kind of um, held in the currents. It looks almost that you can walk out on them. That's really deceptive. Um, don't try that, by the way. Um, the littoral zone is the, um, the inner tidal zone all the way up. So when the tides come in and out and in and out, um, down to the lowest low tide, okay, and then subtitle, all the way up to the spray or splash zone. So as the um, ocean waves or um, the water comes and sprays up, you know, it's kind of that highest um, zone up there that's the spray zone. Um, so um, when we have that kind of that just sprayed area, that's where that um, ulva intestinalis formerly enteromorpha. Sorry, I did change it on the slide here. Things are changing. You know, with DNA analysis, um, different plants are being grouped different ways. So um, we see a little bit of, um, you know, um, differences in their scientific or Latin names um, that are published. And a lot of the books say the old names for them along with the new ones anyway. Enteromorpha intestinalis is the same as ulva intestinalis. And so that grows up in the high zone. We love riding the ferries up in the San Juans and you can see up on the rocks up there, um, these little pockets of green and it's where all the um, intestinalis is growing in there. And you can see it from a great distance. It's like this little bright kind of neon green beacon that's there. Um, in the kayaks, we can see them way across the bay and say, I know what's growing way over there. Um, and then we can go from there. Anyway, so from there, let's let's pop down to the high intertidal zone. So that next layer down. Okay, so spray or splash zone, and then um, the high intertidal zone. And we get in there those marine algae that will um, really accommodate differences in temperature and moisture. You know, the heat of the summer those dry out on the rocks there, their temperatures rise. Um, and as the water covers them up, they rehydrate um, and cool down. So they have to be able to withstand this great temperature fluctuation and moisture fluctuate, fluctuation. This is where our fucus or bladder rack, stir fry weed grows. Um, and um, it accommodates this change um, by having a little bit higher fat content to it um, that will tolerate those differences. Um, but also, um, this is one that will keep for a really long time, has that ability to withstand those changes 
but also means that it, it um, one of the few that can be preserved for a long time, fresh in our refrigerator. I love this one because it has those little bladders in there. Um, and invariably, you know, with the sun shining, we're out on a beautiful day, um, doing our gathering of seaweeds. Um, you know, I'll get sunburned. This is the most amazing gel. So many of you know, have seen, I get sunburned right on the end of my nose right here. And I put a little bit of that gel on and it just soothes and cools. And oh my gosh, a lot of us know about aloe vera gel. This is, I don't know, to me, it's what's accessible. It's so useful. Then I'll just kind of put it all over my skin and it makes my skin soft and smooth. And you know, it's like the best moisturizer ever. Okay, so men and women alike can enjoy it. I have a little tidbit to share about this in a minute. So stay tuned because you'll like this one. Anyway, fuca, stir fry weed, we can use it internally, externally. Also, we find a little bit of porphyra. Most of you know this as nori. Okay. Mm -hmm. As we go down to you know, the tides going out. We have the mid, um, um, we go from the mid inner tidal zone with the fucus and porphyra down to the low inner tidal zone. So um, kind of, this is what's exposed at lowest of the low tides. Uh, sea palm, which is postelzia, um, stands there and it loves to be battered by that hard surf. And those little sea palms will be standing up there, be knocked down by these waves. And then when the water goes up, they stand up, shake their little heads, and it's kind of fun to watch. Okay. It's kind of addicting. You just sit there for hours and watch these. Um, except for when the tide covers them up, right? Um, and then egregia or feather boa. They have little bladders on them. Um, we like to pickle them. They look like little olives. You know, you put those in your martinis, right? Um, Bloody Marys. Okay, you know, we have some good news with some not so good balance in life, right? That's what we're going for, balance in life. So we can have a little bit of that um, as long as we balance it with, you know, good nutrition too. Malaria or green kelp, a lot of um, our brown um, marine algae is the theophyta group or the kelps live there um, along with um, sugar rack saccharina. And then deeper, um, when the tides go out, we still have some of our kelps that grow out beyond this area. They're attached very deep. And with bladders or bulbs, these air-filled um, bulbs, they'll float to the surface where they can photosynthesize, but their holdfast or haptra on the bottom of them attaches to the benthos, um, and then they grow up and are amazing, amazing plants. You know, uh, some of us know our Neriocystis or bullwhip kelp. Um, it is over, sometimes over 200, 230 feet long. And it can grow up to a half a meter a day, a half a meter a day. I mean, come on, really? In a day, you can practically watch it growing. Um, amazing ability of these plants. Um, Macrosystems or perennial kelps are there, um, as well as subtitles. So they, they grow up in these huge kelp forests. Um, so great. So um, here we have, okay, kind of a listing of it, but here we have a picture of that very thing. And so we can see that we really need to pay attention when we go out gathering to the tides. One, it's a safety issue. We don't want to be caught out on the rock island you know, as the tide comes in and we can't get across to the mainland, but also it tells us where are these marine algae located, okay? Um, so we can look for those things. We need to go at the lowest low tide for um, those kelps out there because they grow at the low intertidal zone or subtidal. If we're not seeing them, maybe the tide's in too far. So let's take a look here at what we have. Oops, maybe I have a pointer. Oh, look there, I have a pointer. So up in this area right here, hopefully you can see that on the screen. This is fucus or bladder rack. It's at the highest um, portion of the intertidal zone, okay? And so it has those little bulbs or bladders there, okay? Down below that, let's look at this next band. Okay, fucus up here, 
And this is porphyra down here. This is nori in this section all over these rocks, okay? okay. Aisle two in the seaweed store, okay? Now we're moving on down to aisle three. Down here, the next one, all this green down here. Look at that. Thank goodness there's so much of it because we love sea lettuce, so delicious. And then aisle four, down here, we have um, our kelps. So that's the low intertidal zone. And then it gets down into subtidal. This is a super low tide down here. But you can see there's still more out in the water. Ooh, there's a little echo there. Um, so um, we have all these different layers. So it's important to know um, the tides and that's part of that seasonality. Not only is it a kind of yearly seasonality, but it's a daily seasonality too. Um, and um, here we have two low tides in the Pacific Ocean. We have two um, low tides um, in the span of 24 hours. And one is really low and one is just a little low, okay? Um, in the Atlantic o Ocean, that they're of equal um, heights there. Um, so seasonality throughout the day, looking at those low tides, but we also have kind of seasonality on an annual basis. What's available? What time of year? My seaweed season um, is about mid to end of March. Um, I can um, go out and um, begin um, harvesting there. Um, but really kind of the, the best time for me to go out um, really is in um, later April, May, um, June. Things are vigorous out there. So usually June is my time because I can um, go out to gather so many different species in one trip out. Um, that season continues to early, to, um, early fall of the year. Um, there are a few things that are year round, but kind of May, June, July are kind of our seasons of really prime gathering. Um, by the time later on, um, sometimes um, our more tender marine algae have been beat up by the waves and are uh, kind of shredding. They've lost their spores and sporophylls. Um, and are beginning to kind of bleach out. Um, and so this is kind of their reproductive cycle too. Um, and then they begin to deteriorate and move on to their next phase of reproduction. Um, so seasonality is important. It's not just go anywhere, anytime. It's really, we have to understand and get to know um, our specific ones that we're desiring to bring into our lives. Um, I mentioned that the North Pacific is the most abundant region, but there are seaweeds that have been used around the world um, for, um, for centuries, centuries upon centuries. So um, everywhere we go in those coastal areas, we can find them. Um, and the idea is to be able to identify them, right? Um, but be out there at the right time. We find that um, very similar um, marine algae grow from way up all the way in the Gulf of Alaska, um, all the way down to about um, two thirds of the way down um, uh, California. Um, um, point uh, deception down there is kind of where things change, the waters warm up and um, the seaweed species change just a little bit. But every single marine algae that grows in that region, we can really let our palate be our guide as far as edibility goes. Um, oops. Um, oh, well, let's just look at dead man's fingers. When you say its name, you have to say it like that. Dead man's fingers, right? <laughs> this is Halosacchia, a little thesax. Um, this grows in the high intertidal zone. They're so fun. They're little um, bladders that are there. And if we take them, they, um, they look like little 
balloons and we can stuff them with rice and cook them up. Um, they're great actually on the grill, rice stuffed on the grill because the outside crisps up and the inside is still a little bit moist. Um, so much fun. Or chop them up in little rings and put them in soups. Totally fun to do as well. Anyway, um, where was I? Talking about um, the marine algae that grow in that region. So um, we can we can let our palate be our guide. And the only one that's not um, um, one um, that we would consider not edible um, is Desmarisia or acid kelp. Now the picture of that coming up. I thought it was next, but not so. Anyway, acid kelp has sulfuric acid in it. Um, it's diluted, so um, I show my students. I actually chew on a little piece of it, but you don't want to eat a lot of it. Actually, like the acids in fruit can etch away your enamel. They're all on your teeth. There are people who use it for a pickling solution. So you know, edible, not edible, you know, it's kind of a gray area there. Um, caution is due. The other thing is that we need to be really um, aware of, you know, uh, a textural thing. Um, so many of our marine algaes are really um, hydroscopic. They absorb moisture into them. Um, when we chew on fresh um, sac saccharina japonica or um, sugar rack um, because of the um, high levels of mannitol in there in addition to algin what happens is that um, it absorbs all the moisture from our mouth and turns into this big slime ball in our mouth um, that can be soothing and cooling and um, helpful in some circumstances but it's not my favorite texture and gag on it every time that I demonstrate this to classes. So, you know, is it harmful? No, but um, it's not something that I want to eat a whole lot of either because, you know, I'll lose my breakfast. Um, the other piece is um, when we have um, other marine algae that um, are, um, have a, um, a lot of calcium in them. Um, they are oftentimes really crunchy, kind of like eating um, grit and sand. So when we think about that, um, that we don't want to be eating a lot of those coralline algaes, they're called, and so they're kind of crunchy. But again, we can let our palate be our guide as to whether or not we like it. What's the flavor profile there? So, um, just some other fun ones. Just going to go through some slides here for you. Um, here is um, our porphyra or nori. When we dry it out, we don't do big sheets of it. Um, we use it a lot in, um, in cooking, but crumble it up finely. Um, the way that nori sheets are made is that this is chopped up into little pieces, put in a water bath, and those fine little pieces um, have a mesh screen that goes underneath them and then they're lifted up. So there's a thin layer of all these little flakes. And then this is sent through um, an oven where they're toasted and they turn from this kind of um, reddish brown color um, to green color. Um, and that's why we see them is that they're that green colors because they're toasted and then they're cut into sheets. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through that process. It's almost like paper making out of seaweed. Certainly you could do that if you want to. But we use these a lot in making up our um, seaweed seasoning because of the high protein content, about 43% in porphyra here. Um, anyway, so great one. And then our sea lettuce. Oh my gosh, the flavor of this is just so wonderful. Nutty, lovely. Um, toast them up before or dry them out before you use them. It crumbles really nicely, but in that seaweed seasoning, which I use every single day, you know, seaweeds are part of my diet every single day. And that seaweed seasoning is an easy way to do that. So whether it be your oatmeal in the morning, eggs, whatever, um, it can go on to those things. And this um, uh, 
sea lettuce is a really great one to use. Um, Alaria or weaned kelp we have here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of seaweeds because it's important for us to be ethical harvesters, you know, and to um, gather responsibly. We need to know a little bit about how seaweeds um, grow and how they reproduce. Alaria is one that has, oops, here we go, um, sporophylls to it. And these little appendages right here, this one, okay, these are the sporophylls compared to, see this right here, this mid vein running down Alaria? Um, that's the laminae or blade, okay, lacking in sporophylls. But it has a growth plate here at the base of it. So we want to cut beyond that, you know, the last half or last third of it, okay? And then leave the spore fills to, so that this um, marine algae can reproduce itself. I mean, if we were to take one of those and cook it up, um, it's a kind of tasty, fun. People describe it as tasting like peanuts when we fry it in a neutral oil there. Um, so if there's, you know, a dozen sporophylls there and we take one, it's not the end of the world, but we don't want to make a habit of using those. So understanding how they grow is really important, okay, how they reproduce. So those are the sporophylls. This is the blade or laminae. Um, we never go and scrape the rocks and take the whole plant from the rocks. And unfortunately, there's areas that people have done this. Okay. Um, sometimes nothing comes back in those areas for years. Out at Deception Pass near us, there are places where unfortunately people went out with little rakes and scraped the surface, getting um, all the um, nori, porphyra, and all the sea lettuce, the ulva out there. And that area did not come back for years and years after that. We can collect, use these plants and help us and still um, allow them to continue on growing. We can do that ethically, responsibly, and sustainably. And that's our goal. Have it there for generations to come, right? Um, this is that one species, Desmericea or acid kelp, also called bleach weed. Um, and it is one of those ones that does have sulfuric acid in it. Um, it's branched like this, it's pretty distinct. And when you find it, it's usually washed up and um, the cell structure begins to decompose and it kind of bleaches itself. Make sure you never put it in with other seaweeds that you are um, putting in your collecting bag because it will bleach them out. Also, if you get it on your clothes, um, it is said that it bleaches them out too. I have not experienced that myself, but I try not to get, collect this one too. So, um, this Maristia acid kelp. Okay. So, um, when we go out, we think about those areas that we go out to collect. And um, sometimes we go out in our kayaks, as we see here. Um, we go over to those areas that maybe those subtitle marine algae grow, um, macrocystis or perennial kelp or nereocystis, the bullet kelp, and we collect the fronds from that. Um, in any case, we want to go into really clean areas. This is your responsibility to find this. Not every area that we go to is clean. In the lower Puget Sound area, there's 11% flushing action a year. That means that tide change only allows for 11% um, clean water to kind of come back in. Um, I'm not gonna um, sustain myself on seaweeds that are grown down there. My tide taste one, an example of one, show that, um, absolutely. But I'm not gonna collect my year's supplies down there. I'm gonna go out to where that water is really clean. So while seaweeds absorb minerals from the environment, 
they can also um, concentrate or um, take in uh, heavy metals as well. So toxins into our body. Um, we have to be cautious about this and not gather our seaweeds from polluted areas, um, bays that don't get a lot of water exchange. We also need to find out where it's legal. Every place is different. Okay, so yeah, it's not going to do me any good. I know some of you are um, over in, in Scotland um, and Denmark and Jonas. Um, and so your rules and regulations over there are going to be way different than we have in Washington State or even different from what's going on down in Oregon. The rules are different there. Check with departments of um, fish and wildlife um, for what's legal and what you need. Okay. In our state, we must have a license. So it's pretty cheap. Um, but we need the seaweed and shellfish license. It's a combo license. See what's required in your area. You must have this or else you can get cited. Also, um, it allows you to collect 10 pounds of wet weight per day. So we have some guidelines that are set to make sure that um, there are some for future generations. So we need to know this. Um, we want to go to those good clean areas and beaches that we're allowed to collect on. And then also, um, we want to pay attention to the tides. When is the lowest low tide to make the best use of what's out there? Okay. The other thing that we're going to need um, is um, some good water shoes. You're going to get wet no matter what. Some people wear rubber boots, muck boots. Um, you could do this, you're going to get wet, no matter how tall your boots are, you're going to get wet, they're going to fill up, they're never tall enough, so I just wear an old pair of hikers, because they're sturdy and give me that support, um, water shoes work well, um, but if you, you, you think you have enough restraint to not go over the tops of your boots, then do that. I know people that wear Farmer John's, you know, the scuba, um, um, new frame um, suits that go out, especially if it's really cold out there. So you need to choose your gear. Walking or trekking poles are really, really helpful. It's really slippery out there. Um, it's um, really easy to um, slide um, and injure yourself. So some extra stability of trekking poles is really useful. Okay. Um, a tide chart so you know when the tide's coming in, when it changes, when you need to watch out so you're not stuck out there on a little rock waiting for the tide to go out again. Also, what do we have here? Oh, my seaweed's license. Okay, carry that with me. That's what we need here. Also, it's good to, I love collecting in my basket. Okay. It allows for the water to go through and a nice handle and I can set this down anywhere and it's not going to tip over. Also, if the water comes in, it just washes through it. But um, some people collect in um, nets. This is just a clam net. Um, so you can use that. Or even an old onion sack works great. When we harvest our seaweeds, we want to rinse them in seawater not fresh water. So if they have a little bit of sand on them, a little grit there, take them out and then rinse them out in the sea water. If we rinse them in fresh water, um, in order to balance out um, um, fresh and salt water, those seaweeds begin pulling in all that fresh water into their cells because it's salty in there, you know? And it balances to balance that out between the outside and the inside of that cellular structure. And so they begin swelling and swelling and then they'll burst. Okay, and you lose all the goodness. Don't rinse them out in fresh water. Okay, so take advantage of the seawater um, and the mesh bags um, to allow for um, rinsing out there. Um, coming back, 
if you're putting them in your backpack, and sometimes, you know, we just have a, a pack that we're going to wear on our back, uh, we don't always want it seaweed stripping down our back. You can use just plastic bags, but don't store them in there and don't keep them in the hot sun because they'll begin to degrade really quickly. So just a word of caution. We do what we need to do. Um, we have options um, so we can kind of make use of those. Okay. Another thing that we want is a pair of scissors. People use their knives to cut them with. It's dangerous out there. Um, so if we just take in, we use um, scissors to cut with, we can be really careful and to um, make sure that we're um, cutting ethically. Okay. So um, we, um, let's see, what else do we want to talk about? The hilarious on the uh, licenses. I think I've got that. Washing seawater. Okay. So we kind of go over those things. Um, but um, anywhere that there's pollution in the water, seaweeds can bring that in. So we don't want to be using those because they can concentrate, especially um, heavy metals um, and um, other um, toxins there. Let's see. So we'll kind of go back to just going to go over to here. Anyway, so when we're um, collecting, um, this is one of our students who is wearing his license, um, visible. You don't have to have it visible anymore. Um, and cutting carefully. Now he has a knife there that he's cutting with, um, but all up behind him is a huge rock full um, of fucus or bladder rack. It's just covering this area. So where these plants are abundant also is one of those considerations. Harvest when it's abundant and it's just covering this area. Oops. Hmm. Let's see here. Let's go down here. There we go. Okay. Um, so we can harvest by kayak, but most of the time, 90% of the time, I'm out there just at the um, low, low tide uh, in that inner tidal zone at low tide harvesting. So we we'll kind of pay attention to that. It's wonderful being there. There's so much therapy that we, we get just by being out at the ocean. It's wonderful. So that brings us to after we've collected, what do we do? How do we store our seaweeds? Drying them out and we dry them in sun. Unlike land plants where we dry in the shade, we need to dry seaweeds out really quickly. Um, we need it on hot sunny days, so choose your days well. Keep your fingers crossed for no clouds. Old sheets out in the grass and our seaweeds are laid out there in um, single layers and they bake out there. It works really, really well. Um, sometimes we hang them up. You can kind of see in the background there that they're, they're hung up. They actually don't dry as quickly out um, when they're hung up, interestingly enough. So we lay them out. Um, and then um, you need to store them in airtight containers um, after that. So if you're going to be putting them in plastic bags, and many people do store them in plastic bags, um, you need to double bag them. But if you have glass containers, that's really the best, or um, those food grade plastic that you clamp down the lids on, you can store them in there. Okay, let's see. Oh, I want to um, just come back to stop, stop share here. I want to show you um, back here. This is um, some of the seaweeds. This is um, my nori or porphyra, okay, and just store in those, um, those little crispy places. They're like the greatest little chips. I don't know if you can hear the crunch or not, but they're so good. I have a little saltiness to them, but here's the thing. Instead of sodium, they have about three times as much potassium, so you get that salt flavor. Um, without the sodium. Those of you who are dealing with high blood pressure and are required to limit your salt intake, 
this is that really great satisfying little snack that doesn't spike your sodium levels. It is one of those things that really helped me with my blood pressure issues. You know, I went in to give blood one time and um, this was years and years ago when I had issues, but they wouldn't let me get blood because my blood pressure was too high. It was like 180 over 96 or something like that. I mean, it's horrible. Um, part of that's because I just hooked it up three flights of stairs, but in any case, wake up call, do something about this. We can get our lives back on track and seaweeds be really instrumental in promoting our health and assisting our bodies to be up to their very best. Okay, so what do we have here? Structure, safety, all those. So there are, um, when we store them, remember that seaweeds are um, hydrophilic or hygroscopic, they absorb moisture into them. Um, so we need to be really careful about how we store them. How long do we store them for? Well, seaweeds get better over time, especially those high in protein. The proteins break down to their individual amino acids. So even if they're stored for a couple of years, they actually get better over time. I mean, what else does that? You know, we try to do that, right? Get better over time. But seaweeds do this so magnificently. And then they offer um, these um, protein components, amino acids to us more readily if they're stored over time. Um, some of them can store longer than that. Some of them, you know, to those that are particularly have a high fat content to them, they're still really store for about two years or so. Okay, we don't want them to go rancid. Sometimes dulls or um, palmaria um, is rancid when you purchase it in the stores and you can smell it, it just kind of smells off. If we do this ourselves, we can make sure that we use it in a um, good time, okay? So, um, gosh, um, seaweeds, we kind of go through that kind of pickling or that uh, drying process, but we can also pickle them to store them. Um, some of them do freeze, but usually we dry and then freeze them like nori sheets. If you were to go and um, purchase um, sheets of nori, you made up some um, nori rolls, the open container, seal it back up and stick it in your freezer. It actually stores better. Um, otherwise it absorbs moisture and they just don't, they're never quite the same. Mm. So, you know, the um, documented medicinal uses of seaweeds are vast. This is, these are plants that have incredible antiviral qualities to them. Um, it, they're ones that have been um, showed really great for um, uses for um, HIV. Seaweeds are kind of part of that. Um, we find that that, um, that HPV, um, when you have lung or virus, that um, seaweeds are actually putting contraceptive gels um, to help stop um, the spread of that virus. Um, so antiviral qualities are amazing. In this day and age, where we are right now, that is one of those things that we need to support our system. Um, you know, I really feel that uh, they have assisted me in avoiding colds or flus. Um, I haven't been sick in the last three and a half years. And I think that that's amazing. I used to get sick, you know, a couple times a year and just, you know, it's not so good. Um, but see, it's really support my own um, strength of my immune system. One of the really important things for me is their anti-inflammatory qualities. With the issues that are still ongoing, you know, um, and that age thing, you know, I'm 121 now, you didn't know that, did you? Okay, well, maybe half that, but in any case, you know, you kind of wake up in the morning, you're a little creaky and feeling not so great. Um, seaweeds really, can put us on a course to reduce that inflammation 
and wake up feeling great, have a good night's sleep. They've also been shown to be a really important component, component of lowering our cholesterol, um, uh, lowering the bad cholesterol and maintaining or our lowering the good cholesterol there. Okay. Seaweed's also a really important for helping to normalize our um, blood pressure. And for me, that's been a really personal journey and I'm internally grateful for that. Okay. Toxins accumulate in our bodies um, and seaweeds really help to pull those out. We find that not only do seaweeds pull out heavy metals in our body, but they've been shown in many studies to uh, pull out radioactive um, waste for our radioactive components from our bodies too. Um, this is especially uh, important for um, radiation poisoning. Um, many studies have um, um, shown their kind of efficacy in especially um, for iodine um, 131, which is the radioactive one. A lot of people utilize seaweeds at that time. And if you can get good clean seaweeds, what it does is it nourishes our body, um, our thyroid, fills it up with um, our good um, iodine um, 127, iodine 127, non-radioactive one, um, and doesn't leave room for any of the radioactive to get in because our bodies will take up the 127 um, more readily. Anyway, so it's full, doesn't need any more iodine, so it's not gonna take in the bad. So that's gonna be a really important thing. Um, so thyroid health, there are many of them that help to support our thyroid. One, through extra iodine supplement. You know, we don't need iodine salt because we can get iodine through these um, and incorporation of seaweeds into our diets. I mentioned immune system, strengthening our overall health of our immune system. Um, it helps with bone um, growth, nourishment, um, and cartilage nourishment. Um, and some studies actually show um, the assistance um, or the use of seaweeds actually helps to um, regrow and pump up our cartilage. I mean, wow, how great is that? Um, for weight loss, it works on a multitude of different levels. One, um, because of the extra fiber that's in seaweeds, um, it helps us to feel full. Um, but also, it, uh, seaweeds help us to metabolize fat more readily. How great is that? Um, healthy digestion aids in keeping things passing through, again, partially through the fiber that's there, pulling water into um, our digestive tract and allowing things to move through um, really freely. Um, many seaweeds, because of not only their anti-inflammatory qualities, um, but um, melatonin in them helps us to relax, um, sleep better, reduce sweat, stress, but also um, helps to nourish our muscles and reduce muscle fatigue, cramps, pains. Um, it's really, really amazing. Um, gosh, seaweeds are really high in omega-3s, many of them are, um, which are not found in land plants. So by adding these into our bodies, we can, um, if we are, a vegetarian or vegan diet, it's one of those ways that we can get good quantities of um, omega-3s. Seaweeds are um, talked about as anti-cancer. Um, and uh, anti-cancer in the sense that they help to um, prevent oxidative stress in our bodies, which actually leads to cancer. Um, so um, they're really one of those types of food that really helps our bodies in that preventative role. Um, studies have shown that um, they've really helped to reduce premenopausal breast cancer 
in women around the world. Um, so it's one of those components. All of these things, um, particularly those medicinal qualities, um, some seaweeds do better than others. Um, in the next segment, we're really going to talk about individual ones and what they offer and a little bit of these tests and how we can use different types of seaweeds for specific things that we personally have going on. But I want, you know, just how vast these medicinal uses are. We use them every day as a food and it gets back to that whole piece of, you know, Hippocrates saying, you know, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. Um, so we talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to go into um, some more nutritional uses and ones that are particularly either high in vitamin C, high in iron. We'll get into kind of those unique things in a little bit and lots and lots of recipes. So how we can bring them into our, our daily diet. Um, they're out there. Now's the season. So we get to go out and explore those coastal areas. I'm um, going to go back to just a little bit of the screen share um, and talk about just one last thing in that beyond the edible and medicinal uses of our marine algaes, we find that they can nourish um, our land plants too. And I love showing this picture. Um, this is a little raised bed that I have kind of on a little hill by um, out in the, in the backyard area. And there's a lot of, um, see, a, a lot of uh, plants that are growing right down in here. Um, I planted this garden first about a week before I planted the upper garden. But down here, oops, um, I put my... Um, seaweed compost in the lower bed and turn that in, put my plants in, um, and they just got off to this incredible start. And I was so encouraged. Um, I didn't have any more seaweed compost. I decided, oh, I'm going to, that must be a good spot for the garden. So I put some things in, in the upper kind of next tier up. And you can see that right here. Oh my gosh. They took a long time to come up and they were like, well, some of them didn't even come up and um, um, it was a, it's a little bit drier up there but I tried to keep them all well watered and everything but you can see this vast difference between this lower tier and the upper tier and a huge piece of that is that seaweed compost okay it helps our vegetables to root um, more quickly ready, uh, readily um, have, helps them to germinate sooner and then nourishes those to, um, you know, with all those great minerals in them. So we make a seaweed compost up by just taking all of our little scrappy bitty pieces of all the different seaweeds, mix them in our blender uh, with a little bit of water, and I pour them into a bucket um, until I have this whole five gallon bucket filled up. And I leave that for months and months with the lid on because it gets a little whiffy, just letting you know, with the lid on and it just brews for a while. And I have this wonderful fertilizer tea that I put right into the garden soil or yeah, the soil. Um, I've done it after I've planted the seeds and just watered that way. I've mixed it in beforehand and just kind of churned it in, especially if it's still a little chunky, I'd like to turn it in. Um, and it will be incredible. So don't throw away all those little bitty scraps, use them and make this great compost tea. Okay, so just that piece of things. So we have many, many um, ways that we can use seaweeds. Um, it's a gift of the earth, a gift of the oceans. Um, by bringing them into our lives, we are well nourished, we are strengthened, we can heal on so many different levels. So bring them in as your food every single day um, and they become your medicine on a daily basis. Um, they nourish our bodies in so many different ways. Um, but we give a toast to the gifts of the ocean, right? 
um, and all that they bring to us. I have some of my favorites of that. And then we're gonna do a little, um, we're gonna break for another 10 minutes, but don't go away because um, I wanna come back and show you how to do our three sisters seaweed seasoning. And then we're gonna make up some of those power balls too. And then I'm gonna eat in front of you, right? Okay, so um, take a little break, 10 minutes, come back and, um, and I'll show you how to do those three sisters. Somebody had a, oh, before we go, somebody had a question about what were those little things in the three sisters? Um, <laughs> they, um, they're um, little sea lice. <laughs> we didn't put them in the three sister seasoning. It was just in a shell. They had come back with some of our seaweeds that, and we put them off to the side. So it was just these little, um, crustaceans that were there and the three sisters. I think there's probably a few more questions and we'll get to them um, in a little bit. Okay, come back in 10. Oh, there we are, <laughs> right up there. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> gotta get it right. Um, I have, should have brought a, a little cloth in, but that's okay. We'll just do this anyway. Oops. Uh, unmute yourself again. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Are we good to go here? Yep. Awesome. Okay. And we're back. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you for this um, coming back on. We have a couple new recipes and one of the um, things that I wanted to share with you is um, how just a simple seaweed seasoning can easily um, transition to almost every meal that we have. I have my little, um, here we go. Sorry, my, my dirty hand, I was playing with my food again. Um, <laughs> let's see if that is, maybe you can read that. Three Sisters Seaweed Seasoning. And um, I've been mixing some up here, and I don't know if you can kind of see in there, it's just brown, you know, powdered seaweed. And I mix in a variety of different ones. And I change it all the time. You can find your favorites, but it is so very simple to do. So very simple. So we're going to step back here, try to make sure that we um, have uh, access to here. So, um, you know, I made um, mention that really the forest fairies dropped off this Vitamix on my porch and I love this tool, you know. So, you know, whether it be a mortar and pestle that you're using, a sorbachi, whatever you have, what it, it, it all works. You can grind things up. We've done it out in the field. But you know what? This Vitamix is awesome. So we're gonna start here by just taking some of my porphyra. And I've kind of these, um, the sheets of it right here. And I'm gonna crumble those up. It's pretty crunchy. Try to keep it really dry. And then today, let's see. Ooh, we have a little bit of poor fibra or nori to add to it, some additional. So I guess we're gonna go heavy on the nori here. Usually I do about equal portions of porphyra. And then, oh, this one's gonna have Alaria in it. Always label your bags. You kind of don't know what you have until you open it up. So in you go. 
Usually I'll crunch these up a little bit more, but not my kitchen, I'm working in here, so forgive me. Oh, and Ulva or sea lettuce. That's the green stuff. We tried to pull out all of those sea lice. But you never know when you're going to get a little extra crunch in there, right? It's all good food. So, over here, oh, look, you can see it maybe even. So, lid on the Vitamix, almost. need to watch me do that all day. So what I wanted to show you though is that how much this goes down. So it's not quite finished yet, but it's gone from step this tall down to this tall. Super concentrated, super fine. The finer the powder, I think the nicer it is, especially if you're blending it into um, sauces or you're putting it in breads. Um, using it as a seasoning, sometimes the flakes are nice. But here we go. That's all it is, it's just simply ground up. We'll set that one back aside, you know, for seasoning packets. I got to um, go um, hiking um, for the first time last year with, um, we went backpacking um, with um, uh, Molly, our eldest daughter. And it was really another one of those really iconic moments. Um, for me, it was really symbolized that return to health also. Um, and I was strong enough to do that and carry extra weight. Um, and one of the things that I remember to do is to pack my seaweed seasoning. So this one came um, along and went in our oatmeal in the morning. And uh, we actually ended up being at a high mountain lake. What was on our fish? Okay, three sisters seaweed seasoning. So. It can be you know, used for many things, but my big container of it is in a sprinkle container just on the kitchen counter and it goes in so many things. So we can use it as simply as its own or we can make our power balls. And these, oops, I guess my head doesn't show. So I'll sit down just for a moment here. So um, here I have, and this looks really gross, I know, but it is so good. So right here is ground up dates um, in the Vitamix, just chop them up and some cranberries. So equal portions of each. And then also um, I ground some hazelnuts. You can use your favorite nuts, um, but I, um, you know, in the Northwest we have hazelnuts or filberts out here. And so I roasted them. Um, in the oven um, on about 300 for about 20 minutes um, and then let them cool and then I ground them up into a powder and so those are all mixed in here too. So kind of equal proportions of nuts to dried fruit. Okay, you can use whatever you want. 
mix those together, and then sprinkle the Three Sisters seaweed seasoning on there and mix it all in. So here's what you get. You get the protein with the nuts um, and also the seaweeds, that incredible mineral content um, that seaweeds offer. So you kind of, you get that electrolyte re replenishment and kind of quick burst of energy from those dried fruits that are in there. So you get for the long haul, you get electrolytes, you get a quick energy, all of those things mixed together. If you then take those here and put them in little balls, and then I'm going to, I don't know if you can see this, I have coconut right here. Okay, just roll them in the coconut, press it in. It also keeps them from kind of getting sticky together. Get the real coconut, not the gross stuff, okay? Oh my gosh, and that smells so good too. So now I have this little seaweed ball right here. Oh my gosh, these are the best. Hors d'oeuvres, little snack when you're going out hiking. Um, it can even be dessert, doesn't matter. These are so good. So that's the simple seaweed um, power balls and three sister seasonings. Oh my gosh. It's so good. It's so good. You have to make these. Okay. That's what I'm going to be doing this afternoon. Deliciousness. Now, <laughs> you can make them into cute little shapes if you want to, but just these little ones are so good. Anyway, so there you have it. That salty, that sweet, that nutty thing going on. So delicious and so good for us. Um, so it doesn't have to be like eating seaweed, right? It can be so wonderful. Be creative, um, be inventive. You know, the coast waters bring us so much goodness. Um, I hope that you all will take an opportunity to explore them. Um, and, you know, we give thanks for the blessings of the earth and ocean. Yeah. We have some new series, the remainder of the series coming up. Um, if you're interested in exploring further about specific marine algaes, um, they're great nutritional, um, specific medicinal benefits, a little bit about the studies, how to identify them, some new, recipe, new recipes. Um, I hope that you'll join in for the remainder of the segments. Um, I love sharing about this. And as you know, that it has transformed my life, has returned life back to me. And I know that it can for each and every one of you, no matter where we are, um, it can create additional goodness. Okay. I'd like to take an opportunity to kind of open up for questions, if you have that. Um, so um, we'll take a few minutes to do that. Everyone is unmuted right now. So if you want to ask a question, go ahead and unmute yourself there. Hi, Jeannie. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and Dave wants to make sure that Brad isn't sleeping. Or, I mean, um, Frank wants to make sure that Brad isn't sleeping. <laughs> um, just to wake up out there, Brad, if, if you're sleeping. I want to ask about seaweeds, uh, um, those that you know, are perennials, and the way we them, like we can with land plants. You know, like with land plants, often if they're annuals, they're very good. Pull up, pull up. Is there a way to tell with seaweeds? Jeannie, you know, I'm only catching about every other word, so um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Well, maybe I'll take my video off and that might help. 
Right. Um, so my question was about animals and perennials, and whether it's easy to tell uh, with seaweeds which is which, like you can to a degree with land plants. Se seasonality, is that what I'm hearing? Um, annuals and perennials, which ones are annuals and which ones oh. are perennials? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so um, you know, we have macrocystis, which is perennial kelp. Um, and even nereocystis, the bull kelp, is perennial, but it breaks down during the winter. So you only find a few of them there. Um, many of the other ones um, start early and start growing. Um, the um, the um, uh, dulse um, or palmaria. Um, starts and sometimes you can harvest that, especially um, over from where you're from and, you know, Ireland, Scotland, you know, those coastal areas, sometimes the season starts early, but very little of it lasts throughout the winter. We get a little bit of um, fucus or bladder rack here, but it's minimal. So mostly it's um, much of those that are um, those giant kelps. Um, we can find more of them, um, and the rest of them are really pretty simple. Okay, great. Anything else? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I sent you a, a chat, a private chat. I'm not sure if you saw it, but, um, and I'm signed up for the other classes, so maybe you'll discuss this then. But can you rec? I'd like to get started now on the medicinal use for uh, fatigue, tiredness, uh, just feeling it overall. You know, I need like 10, 12 hours of sleep, and I'm still tired sometimes. Is there any type of uh, seaweed or a product that I can go out and get today? Um. So you um. So. A lot of that is really dependent upon what this comes from. You know, it's symptomatic for me, that was really symptomatic of low thyroid, um, appeared with high blood pressure. And um, I use um, fucus or bladder rack for that. Um, and then neurocystis for kind of a salt substitute to eliminate salt from my diet. Um, but also um, there's um, our, um, Kombu, it's called, basically it refers to um, saccharina um, species um, that also can, um, you know, help with kind of energy boost, sleeping well. Um, and uh, so that might be one that you would add in. I would say actually uh, kind of broad spectrum, any of those can assist with us, but there's some specific ones. Um, and, and we will go into a lot of detail about, you know, the melatonin content or, um, you know, how um, the different ones work, but um, that might be a piece of it. Um, I would say that, you know, it's hard for me to say for sure, but not knowing um, kind of a history and what specifically is going on, but um, maybe we can have a private chat about that. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. I'm yeah. really happy to do that. Okay, good. I'd like that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. <laughs> hey, Wyatt, thanks. <laughs> okay. Well, um, Dave, do you see any other questions there? I think that, I think that's about it for right now then. Okay. Okay, well, um, we can address them at another time. So think about those things. And um, I wanna just say thank you to all of you who have joined in near and far. Um, I hope that um, seaweeds um, get an opportunity to come into your lives and um, to bless you as they have blessed me. Um, thank you to, to Dave for um, making all the tech part stuff work out. Um, and we'll look forward to um, our next session. You'll also be getting um, a little um, handout of resources. I didn't, uh, it was really hard for me other than just to type up a list of resources where you can purchase really good marine algaes. 
um, for your own personal use if you can't access them um, soon. Anyway, thank you all. Hope you have a good week. Uh, maybe I'll see you next weekend.